Inside Science. This month, two coronavirus vaccines had notable trials published. One comes from a set of laboratories in China, and the other from Oxford University in the UK. And the results are pretty encouraging and pretty similar. So both vaccines are injected into the arm, both were tested at the same dose, and both have some side effects. Tiredness, headaches, and a high temperature are some of the most common, more so in the Oxford study than the China study. But the biology looks encouraging. So a successful vaccine stimulates two types of cells in the immune system, T cells and B cells. Now, B cells produce antibodies against a pathogen, like a virus, and both of these vaccines stimulated B cell antibody production, up to around similar levels as those of people recovering from the actual disease. The vaccines also stimulated T cells, which responded to the spike protein that sits on the outside of the virus. Now this is great news, because it seems like a T cell response is also important to successfully fight the disease. So these studies were phase one and two trials. They tested whether the vaccines were safe in humans and whether they were having the right kind of biological effect on the immune system. In phase three, which comes next, they'll test the vaccines on large groups of people to see if they actually protect against COVID-19. But we still don't know when they'll be ready for public use. So if we want to avoid a second wave of the virus, we're going to need other tactics. And you can read up on what those tactics might look like in this Inside Science article. Now, coronavirus tends to hog the headlines, but a lot of other great science surfaced this month. Now, take a look at this. Those are sharks nosing up to an underwater camera on a tropical reef in French Polynesia. That's one of 371 reefs across the world that was monitored for shark activity by a team of international scientists. So they set cameras across the reefs, they baited them with about one kilogram of oily fish, and then they counted how many sharks paid a visit to the camera in the first hour. Now this is the largest ever global study of reef shark populations in their coastal habitat. And it's pretty shocking. Nearly 20% of the reefs had no sharks on them at all. So part of the problem is fishing, specifically with gill nets or long lines. Where this is allowed, shark numbers dropped by over a third. But on the flip side, that suggests a simple solution. And the study found that banning those kinds of fishing, where possible, would lead to a jump in shark numbers. Other ways to boost shark numbers include limiting fish and catch, closing areas to fishing entirely, and creating shark sanctuaries. More sharks means better balanced ecosystems and ultimately healthier coral reefs. But while these scientists were searching the sunlit shallows, another group of researchers were trawling the ocean depths. They were looking for fish that hide in the dark, specifically ultra black fish that reflect tiny amounts of visible light, less than 0.5% of what hits them. So how are these fish so black? Well, the answer lies in their skin. So the researchers took very detailed microscope images of their skin cells and found structures inside called melanophores. Now, melanophores contain black melanin pigment. But unlike other black-colored creatures, the melanophores were so tightly packed that they left no space for any other cellular structures at the surface of the skin. They also have a special shape that doesn't reflect light back out of the skin, but instead scatters it sideways into the tissue. Now, predators in the deep sea often hunt with lights, so being unreflective makes sense for these fish. And their ultra-black melanophore organization could inspire new kinds of synthetic ultra-black materials. And lastly, how about a drink? Mezcal? I think so. But how do you know if it's the good stuff? Well, mezcal makers have a trick they squeeze a bit into a glass and they look for the bubbles. If the bubbles are bursting quickly, then chuck it away. But if they last for 30 seconds or more, then you're onto a winner. Now, a team of fluid dynamic researchers have discovered why that trick works. So good mezcal has around 50% alcohol content. Now, the physicists found that when water was mixed half and half with alcohol, it became more viscous, more gooey 
which made the bubbles less likely to pop. But that wasn't all. Watch this. Convection currents are drawing liquid up into the mescal bubble. This isn't normal. The liquid normally stays down, but it turns out that the lower layer of mescal contains more surfactants than the bubble layer. These surfactants change the surface tension between the two layers, and that leads to Marangoni convection, which creates the upward flow that you can see between the two areas. This flow constantly adds new liquid to the film of the bubble, which makes them last even longer. And with that infusion of drinking knowledge, I bid you adieu for this month. Cheers. Inside Science. If you enjoyed this edition, follow us on the web and social media. Powered by the American Institute of Physics and a coalition of underwriters.